everybody. So welcome to the very first annual Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase. You might be asking yourself, why is there a showcase? Well, I often get the question, which tool is right for the job, especially when I am dealing with knowledge graph and modeling questions. And what I would like to do is share with you some tools that I often point people to, some that are new on the scenes, some that are going to be a surprise. And before you ask, none of this is sponsored. I have not been paid to do any of these. I reached out to everybody on my own time. They were kind enough to meet with me and film these. So I hope that these honest reviews, all of these are my own opinions that I often help people with when they ask me questions. I hope this helps you in your search for the next knowledge graph technology that you want to dive into a little bit deeper. All of the vendors that I'm going to be talking to, I have more information and their contact information in the description below. And if I missed any tools that you wanted to see me review, or if you have questions about the ones that we are reviewing, please leave them in the comments below. I and the people that I'm talking to will be able to answer those questions for you. All right, and so what is the criteria that I'm going to be walking through? There will be a summary at the very end of each video describing the answers to each of these questions as well as a summary of any other little tidbits that we find out. So the main things that I ask are, what are the use cases that the tool is usually or best suited for? Also talking about that, what features do they have to actually support those use cases? That's pretty important in understanding if they're going to meet your needs. The other thing I like to talk about is what kind of data, what kind of format, and what kind of query language does the tool support? Two additional things I talk about, because I think they're pretty important, is first, interoperability. If a tool is not interoperable, sometimes it's a make or break moment. Other people don't mind if it's not interoperable. So we will certainly see people on both sides of the coin in these reviews. The other part is, is this SaaS or not? A lot of people that have small development teams or no development teams don't have the resources to set something up that's not SaaS. So I will be asking these questions as well as many more. So please join me in the next few episodes. So with that, let's check out this video's tool of choice, which is... All right, and with that, let's go kick it off. All right, so today I am here with Dan and we are gonna be talking about Timber. It is actually one of the top new graph startups I heard, so I wanted to get some time to talk to you. So Dan, do you wanna introduce yourself? My name is Dan Weitzer. I'm the co-founder and VP R&D in Timber AI. We do SQL knowledge graphs, so um, we don't uh, really see ourselves as a graph database, but we see ourselves more like a virtual layer that comes on top of your existing relational database. So essentially you're sucking out all the knowledge that's in a regular tabular format and making it serviceable for people that are used to using graph-like structures is kind of what I'm hearing. Uh, we're just mapping the database to the abstract layer where mm -hmm. you model the concepts, create the graph. Yeah, no, and that's that's really helpful because I know there's a lot of people that struggle to understand, okay, I have relational databases and I see this graph thing. It sounds like I'm, I'm interested in it, but oh, it sounds like such a pain <laughs> to have to take all of the data that I'm so used to and all of my systems that I'm used to and then translate it into this weird graph thing. So it sounds like you're trying to meet everyone in the middle, which is pretty exciting. So if we want to jump in, can we see what this looks like? Oh yes, of course, of course. This ontology, every ontology starts with a thing, right? Uh, yeah. We adhere to the uh, semantic web principles. Every ontology that is OWL-based or RDFS, we can automatically translate it to SQL, and then you'll have the ontology in SQL format because all our syntax for creating concepts is a, in SQL is our word for uh, classes in, mm -hmm. in OWL and RDFS, and um, with properties are art attributes and relationships are just uh, attributes as well, uh, object type properties. Our real strong power is mapping it to your existing data sources that you have in, on your mm -hmm. relational databases. So we start here in this screen, we see the uh, ontology explorer. It's where you author your ontology. 
So you can start by, for example, creating a new concept that's called the person, and we can give mm -hmm. it a description, a, a person, name, and city, for example. And we can either create new properties or we can mm -hmm. import from your existing uh, relational database. So oh, we're nice. Gonna, so we're, we're striving to make it as easy as possible. Uh, so now I have these uh, properties in my abstract concept and I can give it uh, some sort of uh, entity label um, for the concept, which will be a first name and a last name of a person. And I can create the new concept. And now I'll have the new concept here. Um, when I click on it, I can see all the, the properties that it has, a relationship it doesn't have any at the moment. Um, and if I go on and create another concept that derives from person, let's say uh, an adult, I can see that automatically I have all the inherited properties from the father concept. And I can mm -hmm. say, okay, the, an adult is actually a person that has an age uh, greater than uh, 30, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a modern day adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can go on and model your ontology this way. Um, but you can also, like I said before, uh, create it in plain, simple SQL. Mm -hmm. So th this is the syntax. It's just like creating a table, create or replace table in SQL, where you mm -hmm. define the properties that you have, uh, yep. pr a primary key, a label for the entity label, from which concept it inherits. This gives you the inheritance. Mm -hmm. um, stage and you have the description, also the relationships, but you can also do the mappings themselves. I didn't show the mappings, uh, so let me show the mapping one moment. Okay. So if I go to person, so since I uh, created these concepts from a relational uh, a data source from, from my table, um, the person table, so let me find uh, where is the, oh, from this schema. Uh, here I can see all the tables that I have mapped or unmapped. At the moment, nothing is mapped, so I select the person. I can see that I can uh, query the table to see the data itself, what it has. I can see which columns it has. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the next step. And here it tells me uh, which uh, columns in the table are mapped to the properties in the person concept. So can we stop here for a second? Okay, so sure. you've got these concept properties and when you were going in and you were creating a a new thing, you, you created person, a lot of these properties were already evident. Where did those come from? So I, I imported them from this table specifically. Oh, I see, okay. I, I, could, I could also give them a different name if I want or mm -hmm. if I want, I need to edit, for example, the city column and say, this is not a city. This is actually a cast of a city as, a, I don't know, something else. I can go on and, and make all the uh, SQL functions themselves mm -hmm. in the mapping themselves, in the mapping mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. but, but, but when you query the knowledge graph, you don't need to know what logic you applied here in the mm -hmm. in the mapping stage you just go on and query it as a concept so i go on create the mapping i can go and, and fetch the sample data so control. you know when you're using sql you've got multiple tables and those tables could be talking about different aspects of a person in this case one might be purchases that the person made another could be personal information but some of that data is going to overlap. So can you connect the multiple tables together? And then if you can, how do you then disambiguate the, the data that's there? That, that's a great question. Sometimes you want to disambiguate the data and create one source of truth. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you want to have multiple sources of truth because yesterday when you registered, you had a, a certain address, but tomorrow when you change apartment, you'll have a different address and maybe you want to have those both uh, types of data. Mm -hmm. uh, stored. So it, it really depends on the use case that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. We believe in uh, multiple sources of data. So having duplicates is valid. Uh, it all depends how you want to do it uh, or not. Okay. You you do the exactly. Okay, the, so that's uh, that's a good point. So it, it it's acceptable to have duplicate information. And you're saying that if you did want to, if your use case was to deduplicate your information, you would have to do that. And then this system would then pick up after the fact. Oh yes, yes. And and okay. you can you can do it with the system in the mapping okay. stage. You can create the joins in the table or unions or oh, okay. so you can you can handle it in the mapping area. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll get only the 
adults that uh, the people that have age over than 30, mm-hmm. right? Like we specify. So that's a validation step because you had a business rule, how you're defining that and it is adhering to that. That's good. Yeah, exactly. And you can define a, uh, however rules that you want uh, on the logic side of mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. but uh, let's go on and uh, create our whole ontology uh, by running this query. I can see suddenly that I have an ontology. And now uh, I have also relationships. Mm-hmm. When we click them, we can see the source and the uh, target of the relationship. Mm-hmm. You can also search for certain relationships that you have in the graph. Oh, that's nice. So yeah, if you, if you want to see, for example, thank you. If you want to see, for example, uh, I don't know, Kali and made call, only this mm-hmm. one, and I want to make a new graph out of it. So now I can see, okay, these, these are the relationships that I selected. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I click on them, I can see how, how they are re- related. But let's say the, the crunch based ontology, it's also nice. Uh, you have only 68 concepts here, but it's, uh, you can see it's a bit larger. I see. And where are the, where I see that there are certain circles are bigger than others. So where is that? Is that something that we set up in the schema level in the actual ontology, or is that something the system does for us? Well, this is something that the system does for you, but we mm. can easily change it. Yeah, and I, I like this um, because a big reason that I like these two views that you just showed is what I have found is having a graphical interface. Where of course you can query that, right? But having that graphical interface to be able to see it very quickly and more importantly, take screenshots so you can share with business stakeholders that don't really understand the data and don't want to see you running queries. This helps you understand the health of your ontology because if you have too many branches that are um, kind of getting close to like an orphan node where they don't actually Mm -hmm. have a lot of substance to them that gives you an indication that you need to go and do something with them and also the um the level the concept level um in semantic search that's really helpful also for if you're trying to do recommendation engines um Mm -hmm. or um type aheads where you want to maybe start with um, the level ones that are um sort of on the broad side and then maybe help the user drill in i think that really helps absolutely yes you're right you're very right and and you also asked about the the sizing of the the nodes Mm -hmm. and now i can see that company probably has a lot of children because it's big so yeah, when you click on a concept, you can see all the inherited, how many inherited properties it has, how many direct mm-hmm. properties mm-hmm. it has, uh, the different relationships that it has. We have uh, different types of relationships. We have uh, many-to-many relationships mm-hmm. that uh, mm-hmm. go through a, a table, a certain table, for example, to connect a different concept. But it's almost as if you're just putting another lens or a filter on top of your SQL where this is maybe um, processing it into graphical like structures at runtime. Is that usually where that happens or where does that happen? So we push down the query. What we do is we, we our uh, virtual layer uh, rewrites the query uh, so that you can access the, uh, you can treat it as a knowledge graph, but what happens behind mm-hmm. the scenes is that you get a very big query with a lot of joins and push down mm-hmm. to the relational database. And mm-hmm. that's where the, all the magic happens. The, the leap that I'm trying to make in my mind is, you know, on the surface, I love this idea that you don't necessarily have to get an entirely new type of database. You don't have to do, make a whole nother pipeline. I mean, there's a lot of really big benefits for this. But then I start to think through, you know, the value of, of, of a regular graph database is that you have, let's say, three hops to get to the answer that you're looking for. If you're still continuing to use those tables behind the scenes for this, you are still technically needing to make all five of those hops. Is that accurate? It's just this is doing it for you automatically behind the scenes. So you don't have to do all the joins yourself. So yes, if if you model it accordingly, you don't have to do any join. And I can show you an explain query, uh, how it looks before you do it and after. And that then you will see the, the amount of data that you. So what, one of the use cases that we did was uh, with uh, HR, a HR department in a very, very big retail company employing mm-hmm. tens of thousands. And uh, they had a problem that they were trying to uh, know. I want to see all the managers and the direct managers and their direct managers. Mm-hmm. All, and they couldn't figure out how to do it. So, so when you create any ontology, you get a, you get actually four schemas that we provide. 
you get timber, you get D timber, you get E timber, and you also have G timber, which is for the graph algorithms. Each concept gets uh, added to these three schemas. So what's the difference between them? So uh, timber has all the relationships of uh, and the inherited relationships in the metadata itself. E timber, if you go to a base concept, for example, oh, one moment. For example, if I go to department and I look at it from the e-timber perspective, I will get all the properties of all the children as well. So that's so, the inheritance, basically. Yes, okay. but, but, but it's like a reverse inheritance because I see the, the properties that I, are direct to each one of the children. Sometimes oh, so it's a, roll, it's a roll up of the children's properties. Exactly. Ah, exactly. I gotcha. Okay. The d-timber one shows you also the relationships. Uh, that can you you can set to see uh, by default one hop in the graph, but you can uh, change it in the configuration of the ontology if you want to see two hops in the graph in your metadata because it can get uh, very very uh, long if you do more than one hop. So then what it's doing is it's looking at the main node that you're looking at now is 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 the starting point, and then it's looking at one hop out with the relationship of contracts? Yes, if I want to see a person who has a manager, for example. So now we have the manager name, the manager position, and the uh, name of the employee and the position of the employee. So now, if uh, this is a transitive query, so this means, uh, this way it has the star five in it. This means that it goes five times deep into uh, the query. So if I want to see the transitivity level of the query level, okay, let's run it again. So now I can see, for example, that Jennifer Zamara is the CIO and three deeps down, she has an employee that is a BI developer. Looking at hierarchical data from table, uh, not so easy. So sometimes uh, it's much better to look at it as a graph. And for that, we have the data exploration way now every node represents a data point in our uh, the data itself when i click on it i i get all the properties of that data point i can go on and and bring the this position for example uh, forward or the performance score and suddenly if i have other nodes in the graph that share the same uh, property they will get connected so right here i can drill down to the concept that I'm uh, querying. If I want to get only managers, as employee of managers or has employee of team members, I can drill down to the concept itself, but at the moment it's, so it's fine. I'll just uh, leave it as it is. And when I run it, uh, suddenly I, I get an explosion wow. of all <laughs> persons, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, so now I can go on and do this again. I can go to person and say, okay, from these new persons that I got, I want to see all their managers. For example, so uh, I go on and run the query again, and now I get all the managers of these managers uh, connected. And at the end, I can have a very nice graph uh, showing exactly who's connected to who. That's nice uh, that you have, it, it really does seem like you put a lot of thought and effort into the graphical representation, which I really do appreciate. It, it seems like you would really need to make sure tabular data is structured really well in order to to do this um, and to make sure that you really understand the anomalies that are in your data as well. It seems to me like if you have to have a file and a table to dictate every single kind of hop and, and the different types of hops that you're making, that it might slow down if you're trying to do too many. So in the back end, because we don't do any computation ourselves, we push down our queries so if if your backend is a oh it, I see I see okay so the, the 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 compute is is on behalf of whichever database that your customer has because this is just a layer on top that's pushing all of it down exactly. into whatever stack they're using. Let me go to the other example that we did earlier with the HR. Uh, if I go and run this explain query, suddenly you'll see that all this gets pushed down to database. All all of this recursive query. Uh, got made on the fly. Let's see how many lines, 211 lines that some poor SQL developer <laughs> once need to write uh, is only with six lines of code. And the Very performance nice. is great. It's uh, less than 
0.07 of a second. All right, so I thoroughly enjoyed this. I think this is really cool. If you have developers that are very much in tune with their relational databases, this might be that stepping stone for them to get interested and in, in working with graph-like structures without having to go full graph and have to do all of the things that go along with that. Um, so I, I think this is a fabulous thing and I can see why you all are, um, you know, a hot topic this year <laughs> and hopefully you. years to come.